Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Is this working? Good. So, I've noticed something weird lately. You meet someone in real life, or you follow them on Twitter, and you find out their view on one particular topic, let's say the US election. And then, with relative accuracy, you can predict their views on a series on completely irrelevant topics. For example, you start talking about the election and they start telling about, well, there was this weird thing with the mailbox and basically the election was stolen. Okay. Then the discussion moves to the pandemic. And you almost already know what this guy is going to start talking about. He's going to start talking about experimental vaccine. He's going to start talking about Dr. Fauci. And again, that is very predictable. And the question is why? Why should it be that your view on the elections, based on your view on the election, I would predict your take on the vaccines? And nowadays, we could also predict the take of this guy on the Russian-Ukraine war. They would say, well, Russia does wars, NATO does wars, you know, we all do wars, it's basically the same. And this is not something which is specific to, let's say, right-wingers. Let's say in this country you talk to a Remainer, uh, to someone who in the referendum in 2016 they voted Remain, and they tell you something like, Brexit won because this country is institutionally racist or something like that. And then you move to a completely different topic, let's say gender pronouns, whether men can give birth, things like that. And again, you can predict what their opinion will be. But here's the most important thing. The most important thing is not what these people's views are. The most interesting thing for me is how they reached these views. And this is why this is important for us. Because we could be that guy. We make fun of that guy, but in other areas, we could be like that guy. And I know, because I've been that guy, and I still am that person quite often. Because the most distinctive thing and the most interesting thing is, again, how these people reach this point of view. And mostly, they did not do it by seeing at the facts and saying, OK, how do I judge what is happening? How do I judge the pandemic or the war in Ukraine? What they mostly do is they look at other people. And the question is, what do other people think about this big event? And this could take two different uh, directions. The one is, I look to people I like, to people I trust. And whatever they say, whatever my team, my group says, I go with that. What does Tucker Carlson tell me about the war? That's also my point of view. But there's something even weirder which is I don't look to the people that I like. I look towards the people I don't like. So what does the woke mob think about Putin? Oh, they dislike Putin. But wait, the woke mob, they are wrong in every other thing under the sun. Therefore, my conclusion is Putin is not the worst guy. You know, he doesn't endorse gender neutral bathrooms. Therefore, you know, he pieces off the wall. <laughs> Therefore, maybe there's something to this guy. And this process of thinking has a name. This process of thinking where you view the world through the lenses of a group, and where you view yourself through the lenses of the group, is called tribalism. And what is happening with tribalism is that you give up, you elevate the group above your own judgment. So in a way, if you think about it, tribalism is a sacrifice. It's something that it's completely against your interests. And in a similar way, in the same way that you surrender your judgment to the group, it has an equivalent also in politics. This time you don't surrender your judgment, this time you surrender your whole life to the group. And I'm sure you can think of many examples. Socialism. National socialism. So what collectivism is for politics in a way, tribalism is for the way we think. Because what they say is there is something above your own thinking or above your own life that you have to submit to. So for example, you need, we need cannon folders to invade Ukraine. Off you go and die for the country. 
but I don't want to die, and uh, I don't want, I don't agree with this war. It doesn't matter. You don't matter. The country is more important. Go and fight. But in tribalism, the treason is even bigger because you do it to yourself. You tell to yourself that, no, I will not take the responsibility to make up my own mind about what is happening, uh, what is happening in the world. In collectivism, though, at the end of the day, someone needs to give you the order, the marching order. Go there. Someone needs to represent the group. There has to be someone in the Kremlin, a Stalin or a Putin or someone who tells you, I decide what is good for the group, so you go there and you die. Similarly in tribalism, at the end of the day, someone has to take the decision whether, for example, the vaccine is good or whether, for example, Putin is a good guy or a bad guy. So what you do in tribalism at the end of the day is you let someone else think for you. Except that this is completely impossible. No one can think for you in the same way that no one can lift weights for you. So if I say, for example, how am I going to make up my mind on what's happening in Ukraine? I'm going to watch the Yaron Bruxo. I trust Yaron. He's a clever guy. So whatever Yaron says about Ukraine, that's going to be my take. This is the equivalent of saying, you know, George is a fit guy. He's going to go tomorrow in the gym and lift the weights for me. He's going to do the work. So it's, it's the same process. In a way, if you say someone else will think for me, it's like saying, I will not think. Now, don't get me wrong. I do what Yaron shows. He's a clever guy. I learn so many things. But my antennas need to be high. I need to judge everything. Do I agree with this thing? And you can learn so many things from people. And, you know, someone is fit and they put workout videos. I can see the video. But then I need to go on and put the work. And the same way, I need to go and put the thinking when I want to decide what is good and what is right and uh, how, to, how to proceed in my life. So why do I talk about tribalism beyond the fact that I wrote a book on it? Because being a tribalist, you see firsthand what is the effect that it has on your life. And the effect is not only that you had the wrong views on politics. So I was a card-carrying Marxist-Leninist. And if you know something about Marxism-Leninism and about the Communist Party, the process is once the party decides, then you have to follow the judgment of the party. And this leads you to a very awkward and difficult position to be. For example, let's say, are we going to support this occupation? My judgment tells me, yes, we have to do it. The way I view the world tells me this is what we have to do. But the party has said something else. So now what I have to do is I have to close my eyes to reality. And I have to say, I have to somehow persuade myself, despite my best judgment, that the party is right. And Ayn Rand has a name for this. What's the name where you see something, but you have to close your eyes and give it up so that you make this made up view of reality? This is evasion, and this is something which is very destructive for your mind. Again, not only in one area. So in, it's not that when I was a card-carrying tribalist, my politics sucked, but the rest of my life was good. Because thinking is a habit, and not thinking also becomes a habit. So when you follow the, quote, party line in politics, soon you're going to take decisions based on random things that have very little to do with reality on other areas. So I was also miserable in my personal life. I was also miserable in terms of other areas of my life. Because again, thinking is not a luxury. It's not like we're going to gather every few months and think, or we're going to have a soiree on Thursday night and we're going to think. Thinking is a necessity, and also it's a habit. And if you, are, if you get this habit, your life is going to be good. If you don't get this habit, your life is not going to be good. And not to concretize only from examples from my life, how many of you have read The Fountainhead? Most of you. So you are familiar with Peter Keating. Now, what is the tragedy of Peter Keating's life? And why is his life going downhill? Because in area after area, he decides not based on what he 
really wants and what he judges to be good. He decides based on other people. So, God knows why. He's in love with Kate. And he doesn't marry Kate. Why? Because there is this other girl and society tells him she's hotter or she's more like a celebrity or whatever. Therefore, I'm not going to go with Kate, whom I really want. I'm going to go for, my spoiler alert, Dominique. Or his career. His judgment tells him, I want to be a painter. His heart tells him, I want to be a painter. And it's not like his heart tells me in a second. It's a conscious choice that he loves painting. But my mother told me and society tells me that there is no esteem in, in painting. Therefore, you have to be architect. And this literally destroys his life. So again, thinking is not a luxury. It's not what, you know, we're intellectuals, we throw our scarf behind us and we're going to do some thinking. Unfortunately, this is how it's portrayed today. And, but no, at the very end, it's a very, very important issue of life and death. Literally, of life and death. So the last point I want to cover is, since we all are nodding that, yeah, tribalism is bad, thinking based on the group and on other people is bad, why do we do it? Why do I still do it in many areas? And why do so many people do it? Because it's the easy option. It's the default option. It's the option that can sometimes make you feel that you are part of a community. Like we're all going to hate the walk together. Therefore, now we're this, I'm part of something bigger than myself. But this is something which is wrong. Because if the community is a community of people who think like you, i.e. who don't think, and they just look at one another in terms of, okay, what are we going to do? And they don't think for themselves. Why do you need this community? It's like a community of zeros. And then you add yourself another zero. So zero plus zero equals zero. Ah, but you might say, I'm going to join a community of clever people and I'm going to do whatever they tell me. So I could say I'm going to be an objectivist and I'll do whatever Onkar tells me. I trust Onkar. I'm not going to do my own thinking. So there are still two problems, though, with this. First, what do I have to offer in that community? I'm a freeloader. So I don't join this community as an epistemological equal that I'm going to do my own thing and I'll offer something to this community. But even worse, in a way, for myself. What do I do to my navigating instrument? I'm destroying it. It atrophies. I'm not using it. So it's not that, it's not that the problem with tribalism is that some groups suck and therefore we have to form another group that have the same characteristic as the groups that actually suck. The problem with tribalism is on how you view the world. And the worst thing in tribalism is not that it makes our culture toxic and like being on Twitter is kind of annoying. The worst thing in tribalism is how it destroys and atrophies your mind. So at the end of the day, communities are great. They've changed history. But what type of communities? Communities of people who think for themselves. And there's this like division of labor. Imagine like a dictatorship and people coming together and saying, look, this regime sucks. So we're going to Put our, mind, put our efforts together, but retain our judgment. So at the end of the day, the question is, do I follow the group irrespective of just because it's my group? Or do I follow the group because we have some common values and we're pursuing these values? So communities are great. Tribalism is not great. And don't confuse these things. So quite often there's this kind of moral blackmail. Or oh, if you're not a tribalist, you're this kind of lone individual, loveless, and all that stuff. No, it's the opposite. You have to be an independent thinker to join a good community and to offer something to that community. So that's what I have to say at the end of the day. Think for yourself. Let's not be that guy that we laughed at at the beginning. Let's not be a Peter Keating because our life will suck. So we have to think for ourselves because there's no other way to live. There's no other way to go through this world. Thank you. So we have like 25 minutes for questions. If I haven't triggered anyone, I failed miserably. Shall we start from that side and get to you in a second? Hello. Yes. Yeah, you see, that's how it's, okay. 
So after reading The Fountainhead, I had a problem with the character of Wynand. I did not understand how he could choose to, let's say, join the herd. Okay, so Wynand thinks that, again, that the way you... I don't, know, I don't think he's a tribalist. He's definitely not a tribalist because he has independent thinking. And this is why Rourke, by the way, accepts him wholeheartedly as a friend because he, he does see the world through his own mind. But he does a different mistake. He considers that by ruling people, so he doesn't sacrifice, he thinks, I'm not sacrificing myself to the mob, I'm controlling the mob. But the way he does it, it ends up that the mob controls himself at the end of the book, if you see his tragic end. But I wouldn't say this is tribalism, because tribalism is mostly on the epistemological level, which means on the way you view the world. So Wynand views the world independently, mostly. He and see this from his artistic judgment. Do you remember that brilliant scene where Peter Keating is reading a book? He doesn't understand the world from the book. He says, but this means what great book this is because Ellsworth Tuhi and all these brilliant people told me this is a brilliant book. What does Wynand does? He has his literally private art collection. No one can get there. And it's only his judgment. So, but your question, why does Wynand give up, is the one question, at the end, again, spoiler, is the one question that I haven't really figured out. So I tell you what, tomorrow there's another Q&A with Aaron, myself, and Onkar. Don't ask this question to myself because I haven't figured it out, but Onkar and Aaron will be there, and this is a great question. Why does, at the end, Wynand submit to the mob? But I don't think it's tribalism. Okay. Thank you. Does it work now? Let's see. Yes. yes. Great. Um, so you said at the beginning that the test to see, to notice tribalism is that you see one opinion and then you know the other opinion of the, of the same person. And I kind of feel that that's the way with the objectivists. All right. right? We all think uh, kind of the same stuff about most, most issues. And uh, I'm wondering, are, are we a tribe? Or maybe, maybe it's only at the beginning that uh, you start interacting with objectivism and you think, okay, this is what I believe and you don't really know it, but maybe hopefully with time you really make that knowledge and belief your own inductively. That's a great question. So let me clarify something. The litmus test for tribalism is whether, not whether you can predict someone's views. I mean, this is something interesting that shows where the culture is. The litmus test is, do you view yourself and the world, and basically reality, based on your independent judgment or based on other people. So could an objective... So, for example, if I read Ayn Rand and I just parrot like, the theory of concepts, I haven't chewed it down, I haven't made it my own. If I just parrot it, again, what am I doing to my mind? I'm, in a way, destroying my mind. I'm parroting right things. So you could say it's better to parrot right things rather than parrot, I don't know, white nationalism or whatever. But still, what am I doing to my mind? I don't own these things. So at best, I'm a freeloader. So here's an example. Let's say I decide, uh, ARI takes a controversial position on some. If I say, because it's my group, because it's the institutes I, you know, I work in, I will agree with them. Although everything inside me tells me that they're wrong, then it's tribal. But if, for example, Let's say I don't understand the topic and I ask someone who knows more, help me to understand this. But I put the effort. And then I say, look, turns out I agree. And it's, you know, it's nice when this is the, the, the outcome because having to go against your group is very painful. I've lost many dear friends who stopped talking to me when I stopped being a leftist. But it's, it's hard, but it's the only thing you can do. So yes, if someone says whatever Yaron says, I'm with him, irrespective of any context, that's textbook tribalism. So by saying I'm an objectivist, doesn't mean that you cannot be a tribalist. Now, if you say, is it a coincidence that you all agree on the basics? If you ask me, it's difficult to agree on the law of identity and then not, for example, get, uh, I don't know, that uh, the rational morality selfishness. So agreement based on judgment, nothing tribalistic in it. Agreement for the sake of agreement, like I have no idea what the axioms are, but some cool people like them, therefore, yay, I like them, that would be tribal. And uh, could you contrast that with the fact that uh, as I'm exposing myself to objectivism, uh, for example, with the issue of uh, climate change and environmentalism, 
I don't know all the facts over there. Like I'm, I'm, I'm. Bottom line, I have an opinion, but it's not really formed. I didn't really form it. I'm trusting ju the judgment of others from this movement I am uh, right. coming a part of. Let me give a slightly different example. You go to the doctor and he says, for example, you need uh, stitches or whatever. Now, you cannot evaluate, but still, you can evaluate whether he's a good doctor or not. You can go to three other doctors and ask, do I need stitches or not? So, although you are not... So, this is basically the question on experts. So, yes, at some point you do rely that they have an expertise that you lack, but still your antennas are high. Still you're judging them meticulously. So, for example, if your doctor on their spare time they do, I don't know, voodoo and black magic, <laughs> you st again, you, maybe you still need stitches, but you're a bit more careful there. You say, okay, maybe I need to ask some uh, second and third opinions. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Yeah, so I was uh, just trying to figure out the best formulation and <laughs> so what would be the best way to, so let's say you've come across a subject which you've never really heard of before, so it's something in quantum astrophysics, for example, and you know absolutely nothing about, what would be the best type of position as you're sort of trying to lear learn it and you've, you know of some experts, but you don't really know enough about the field to actually say whether they're good or not, what would be the best type of position to take? Right. So it would depend also to how important this topic is. So, for example, to the astrophysics, don't really care. When it comes, though, for example, to the pandemic, there was a time, right, last March, last February, where A, we didn't know, oh, two years February now, we didn't know, but at the same time, you have to form an opinion because, for example, do I travel? Do I, or do I lock myself at home? So let's say I see Amy Sadalza, and I, again, I trust him, and he had some actually quite accurate early predictions to get on. But because this topic is so important to me, I try to also see what do other doctors that I, I trust say. Is it that he's the only person in the world who says that? It doesn't mean he's wrong. But then I have to, to be a bit more careful. So you are honest to say, I haven't got a fixed opinion on this. So first is know, your, you know where you stand. And again, you try always have your antennas open to accumulate more and more knowledge. That's the best you can do. There's nothing else. You have to act. So do I go to work or do I lock myself at home? You have to do something and you do it with the best information that you have available. Just try to make sure that the, process, that the method through which you got that best information is a good method. So it's not that, you know, Amy is, is my OAC buddy, therefore, and he's, you know, but again, what are... Why is he saying, is he basing what he's saying on things that make sense? So it's very difficult, but you have to take a position because, again, it's about your life. So, again, thinking is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Okay. Thank you. So if I, if I heard you correctly, you said that you still find yourself having tribalistic thoughts. Yeah. How do you go about rooting them out? How do you go about identifying them and then... Yeah. Dealing Usually, I go to the daily objective and Raka tells me, <laughs> you're a tribalist, get over it. <laughs> so, no, seriously, quite often, it's someone brings it up to you that, you know what, you're getting a bit... And it's tempting, right? So, let's say, for example, you're so pissed off with the left and the damage they do to the culture that anyone who is opposed to them, you have, let's say, the benefit of the doubt. Let's put it very mildly. You have the benefit of the doubt. But then soon you realize, okay, why do I don't like the left? Because of this and this and this. But I see that the other side also has this and this and this. So in a way, it's not in my interest to be an anti-leftist tribalist, because if I hate, for example, toxic uh, uh, public sphere where I am not allowed to say, I don't know, example that uh, particular like biological gender exists, I still wouldn't like to live in a public sphere where I'm not allowed to teach critical race theory at school by guys who have zero idea what critical race theory is. 
So, again, you're not a tribalist not to take one for the team, but it's to your best interest that you stop doing it. And sometimes you need a friend to nudge you and to tell you, you know what, you're a bit of a trouble. Maybe they're wrong, but at least you try to think, why do I really think what I think? Thanks. Hi, thanks for the lecture, super Thank insightful. You. Thanks a um, lot. Coming back to the question, I guess, on before predictability of ideas. Do you find yourself often disagreeing on fundamental <laughs> issues with fellow objectivists? And then the second question is, to what extent does objectivism today encourage also questioning and disagreeing with certain ideas that Ram put forward? Thank you. Thank you. So whether I disagree on fundamentals, There are things that it took me a lot of time to make up our mind. So, for example, I never understood for years the issue of the incompatibility, let's say, of uh, competing uh, power, uh, uh, like uh, governments, the incompatibility with a society of right. And someone gave a random... So, I've read all the theory. I could parrot all the, everything in the theory. But inside here, it wasn't there. And then I think it was uh, on a random Yarom show or something like that. Someone said... What if, let's say, you have a competing uh, Sharia law group and it's competing with something else, and the Sharia group has the most power, the most subscribers, and then it takes over. They say, oh, that's why, uh, that's why private government would not work. So while you have these disagreements, again, you have to be honest. So you, I wouldn't, while I had this idea, let's say around 2020, I wouldn't stand up here and give a lecture on why competing governments is impossible, because I hadn't convinced myself. You know, I put a pin on it, I kept thinking about it, ended up that I saw why. But if I disagree, I would be open. I would say, you know what, I disagree with this. Now, you could say this is, it is fundamental in terms of polity. So you keep an open mind and you try to collect to, to chew this idea a bit more. And usually it's one thing that we learned. It's one example or one concretization that will make you understand something that you didn't understand earlier. Could you repeat the second part of the question? Because I... Um, the second part of the question was just whether objectivism today encourages disagreements with, with Rand or whether essentially you're encouraged to, to view life through the lens of Rand. Right. What does the caricature view say? That the answer is no. First ever class on OAC. Onkar says, I want you to ask me difficult questions. And it's not that, that Onkar said it. There was an assignment, the OSC students know that assignment, where you have to ask questions. And you are evaluated based on the question you ask. So if you ask, quote, party line questions, your grade is going to be three, maximum four if the question is good. If your question is really penetrating, and it, it shows that you are there in being intellectually curious and very intellectually active, you might get a five. I remember the Ayn Rand Con Europe 2019 in Prague. So it happened when? In February. After the conference, it was the first time I got five in a question because Ben Bayer was there and I said, Ben, why do I not get a five in the raising question assignment? And he said, your questions are not insightful enough, sorry. So I think, I think this answers the question whether the objectivist community, or as it's expressed, let's say, by the Iron Institute, whether it encourages this or not. So at the highest level, which is how it trains people it sees as future intellectuals, not only it encourages it, it requires it. Because otherwise, how can you own an idea if you don't really, how to put it, interrogate it, test it? Thanks. Thanks. All right, I got a three-part question here from uh, Dan Hoa from the live stream. Question one, how do you define an independent thinker? Mm -hmm. Question two, how do you evaluate whether someone is an independent thinker? And question three, when people disagree and it's hard to know who's right or wrong, uh, how do you know which side to pick? Okay, how do I define an independent thinker? Someone who at least has the aspiration to make his or her mind based on what is out there in reality. Because, for example, someone who talks to me, so I could respect or I could enter a discussion with someone who said, look, I've seen all the data about the vaccines and let's say this research doesn't add up with this research. Okay. 
But someone who says, well, the vaccine comes from uh, Fauci, who is this and this and this, therefore I don't like it. Sorry, you don't even have the aspiration of being an independent thinker. Because you judge, not based on reality, you judge based on what Fauci or what the people you hate say. So we are not omniscient. So at least trying to be an independent thinker is a, a starting point, And it's for me where I would say, well, at least you have the aspiration. What was the second sub question? How do you evaluate whether or not someone is an independent thinker? Thinker. So the first question is the definition. The second one, how do you evaluate? Well, you evaluate it the whether there's a struggle there. And again, sometimes it's very uncomfortable. So, you know, you go to a Marxist and you say, look, this is what Mises says about the labor theory of value. This is what reality says about the labor theory of value. Uh, can you explain me how Facebook makes money if the labor theory of value works? And after all these things, they say, uh, whatever. I start suspecting that you don't have the aspiration to be an independent thinker. So the question is, do you see reality? Do you see the world out there and try to make up your mind? Or you have already made up your mind, either you know, rationalistically to use the technical term that, oh, I have this scheme in my mind, and if it doesn't work, it works for reality. Or my group, my tribe thinks this. So that's how you, that's how you evaluate. And what's the third one? Uh when you disagree with other people, but it's hard to know who's right, how do you know which side to take? Well, that's difficult indeed. Uh, again, you, try to, you have to try to get more information. What else can you do? You have to, maybe at some point you're in a position where, I don't know, you're in love with two girls, and they both live forever with an airplane in an hour. You're not sure, with, but you have to take a decision. So sometimes you have to take a decision with information that is not 100% complete, but then again, be honest. Know that, look, my information is not complete, but I'll try to take the decision based on the best of my knowledge, based on what I have now. So I, I'm not sure if, it's a, if it covers it, Thank but you. It's fine. thanks a lot. So this, it ends in 10 minutes or it ended five minutes ago. <laughs> I have to MC myself in 10 minutes. Okay, we have that, yeah. Is there any interesting relation between uh, tribalism and conspiracy theorizing? Okay, that's a very interesting, I've never looked into it, but, okay, so could a conspiracy theorist, so let's say someone has a, a, a theory, it's not a conspiracy theory yet, so you ask them, what is the process through which you reach that theory, and if the process is, the people I hate are always wrong, therefore they're wrong again, or they're always up to something, or particularly if they use the terms they. No, they always, hey, so who is they? Like, what are they doing? So I wouldn't be surprised if people who follow conspiracy theories, they follow them because they hate so much, quote, the establishment, that, again, in a way rationalistically, right, deductively, the establishment has to be wrong. There's this new virus, oh, the dots fit. The, the, the virus is created by the establishment that I so much hate. So again, the problem with the conspiracy theory is not so much whether you're right or wrong, it's how did you reach that theory. So you can have a dissenting theory, which doesn't leave, which we wouldn't call it conspiracy theory, but are you ready to test it out? So for example, you're a 9-11 the truther, truth is, how was it called? If you bring them to them, here's Osama bin Laden, and he says to you that I did it, and you're like, still not persuaded. Yeah, then you have faith, or you are, it's, it's in a different level. It's not the level that you came up, it's not even a theory, if it's at the level of uh, faith. So tribalism epistemologically is, is saying, my tribe right, right or wrong? It's and, saying, and yes, yeah, sorry, continue, yeah. The conspiracy the theorist is, is more individual, individualistic in the false sense, right? He's, he prefers his own kind of unbased beliefs and... Uh, Okay, that brings an interesting topic. Is a contrarian, let's say, an individualist? I would say a contrarian is a tribalist from the other side. Because the party liner says, I don't look to reality, I look to my group, and I agree with the group. The contrarian says, I don't look at reality, I look to the majority, and immediately I disagree with the majority. So in both cases, you don't look reality, you look other people. So, to, and this is a formulation I got from Greg Salmieri, Think about tribalism as not reality first, other people first. Thanks. 
So this is another question about objectivism and blind faith. Mm -hmm. So um, everyone who reaches uh, some level of popularity uh, will be parroted by uh, other people. Uh, the will uh, copy and paste like Yaron Brooks uh, argument, Alex Epstein talking point. So is this a good thing? If we see in Twitter, like people copying and pasting your own Brook arguments or Alex Epstein talk points, should we uh, So, oh yes, that, that that's a good thing, but is that a bad thing? Or like uh, if uh, some right-wing uh, politicians uh, steals points from your own book, like uh, he says the turning point uh, USA the people do, like is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? All right, that's a, that's a good question. So. I have in my laptop an 18 pages Word document which is called Don Watkins Writing Tips. But, and I, I'm using them all the time whenever I write something. But again, the point is, I've judged that his writing, he, the way he approaches writing is better than the way I approach writing. But again, I'm not just, you know, he uses this example, I'm throwing this example. If I do this, I'm not gonna be good. Imagine if I go to Twitter and I start posting whatever Alex says. Again, I'm parroting and people will see into it. Now, if you recognize that Alex Epstein in communication has, I don't want to call it a talent because he has worked on it, but let's say has an ability, a skill set that far supersedes mine. So I will try to learn and take things that work and put it in my context. And actually we do this, for example, uh, Yaron Brook, I'm lucky enough, he gives public speaking uh, workshops for, for ARI staff members. Obviously, I'm taking this... Uh, the, it would be impossible not to sound a bit like Yaron when I've consumed his material forever and when he's like my public speaking teacher. But again, if I just parrot what he's doing, people are not going to like it. So you recognize you have something there, Yaron, that I'm lucky. So I'll try to become better. And by trying to become better, I make it more mine, and more mine, and more mine. So that's how I would, uh, that's how I would see it. But if right-wingers, like conservatives, uh, people that aren't objectivists, just like you see them uh, parrot, really parrot, not think about it, and copy-paste the Alex Epstein uh, quotes, do you think it's, it's a good development? It's about how should we see okay. it? Okay, so should if we, we are eight minutes away, let's say, from going to the gulags and by pasting the Alex tweets saves us for another like two months, I would say, okay, that I see how there's like some short term game. But think about it this way. How many conservatives were parroting our free speech slogan, so to speak, and then a year later, they want to regulate uh, Twitter or whatever. So it means they didn't really own them. So if you consider it a victory in some political, tactical sense, maybe it makes sense sometimes, but most of the times, it's going to come back and bite you because they haven't made these ideas really their own. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, question on um, making decisions based on data versus people. Mm -hmm. So uh, a case I'm thinking about is, let's say, I, there is like a new medical treatment, so mm -hmm. we can't know everything, and I you know, like, can't evaluate all the data really. But then, let's say I'm going to look into things like, oh, you know, the say whoever provides it, like is not taking any responsibility for it, uh, but still saying, oh, it's perfectly safe, so these things don't necessarily mix together, uh, or they might have like conflicts of interest. So you know, I'm kind of having some secondary clues. I'm not reaching a firm yes, I'm not reaching a firm no conclusion. Um, but do you think there might be something valid in kind of saying, oh, you know, like if, if they're honest and open, they would kind of say, well, we, we have no data, and honestly, that's what we can tell you. That's the most important thing, being open and honest about what's your level of knowledge. So how much damage has it happened by the people who, when the vaccine came out, they said, not one in a million, you're not even going to get the virus. Every serious scientist told you, look, the vaccine is not about you not getting it, it's about you not being seriously ill. So even if the people who wanted to promote the vaccine were intellectually honest, we would have less vaccine hesitancy. So when you want to score political points and say, no, I, there's not a chance in a trillion years, and everyone who says that there's a chance is a Trumpist or a 6th January science, whatever, then 
again, reality comes back to bite you because now they say, ah, but you told us that with the vaccine, I wouldn't even get the virus. So now I cut you lying. But again, you have to evaluate also that person. Do they want to have a, how it's called, get one on you? Or do they actually try to understand? Because if they're running victory laps that the vaccine doesn't work, and they're actually happy about it, <laughs> something is weird happening there. Like, if, if you're so happy that Fauci was wrong, that you'd rather the vaccine not work, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, talk about, I don't know, premise of death, or I don't know how Rand would, would put it. But that's, that's... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mara, yeah, last, probably last question, but let's see. Uh, in an objectivist discussion group I'm in, there's a man who is not an objectivist, but he wants to learn more about the philosophy. And he's really struggling. He, he wants to know why, if objectivists consistently apply the philosophy, we don't all agree on politics and we don't all vote for the same candidate. And we could not come up with an answer that satisfied him. And we, you know, we talked about, like, there's a lot of variables, politics is a moving target. What would you say to him? What I would say to him, why do you expect an authority to tell you this or this? So the whole point is, no, you think for yourself. So the fact that, let's say, Nikos and Razi disagree on this topic, okay, we're not authority. Let's say, two, let's say it was, remember, there was this discussion between Leonard Pickoff and Jaron Brook on immigration. So if someone says, well, I don't like objectives because it doesn't tell me what to think on immigration, well, you, you're making the whole objective thing wrong. You're expecting an authority to, tell, to think for you. So I would tell this guy, look, do you want someone to think for you? Because then you're doing it wrong. It's one thing to say, help me understand something. So there have been issues that you know, I, I find it frustrating that I cannot really understand why. And I gave the example of competing governments that for years I couldn't figure it out. And I'm sure there are still issues that I can't figure out. So this is okay. This is perfectly fine. But again, how are you trying to solve it? Are you trying to solve it by gaining more knowledge, more information, or more insights? You can say to someone, please give me another example. Help me to see it from an angle that I haven't seen it before. Or do you say, please, someone give me the answer so I give up the responsibility of thinking? So that way, if you want to give up the responsibility of thinking, it's, yeah, I, don't, I want to give up the responsibility for my whole autonomy, for my whole life, basically. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, if you liked all these things. I've written a book on tribalism. It's called Identity Politics and Tribalism, The New Culture War, so you can get it on Kindle or on Amazon. And thanks so much for your, uh, for your attention and your question. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.